What does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi, how are you? Well, look at that. I, I need a, a planter. A shrine to a belly button. Is it a rock of salt? Look at that. No one gets into this, but no one. Nice. Whoa, don't take me too far. Now that's naked archaeology. Every year, Jewish people around the world get together to celebrate a festival called Purim. They dress up in Halloween-type costumes. They parade carnival style around the streets, drink wine, dance and sing the night away. And here, in my house, my family celebrates Purim by getting together in the kitchen and making triangular-shaped pastries called Haman's ears. Do they look like ears? <laughs> but what we're celebrating is actually serious business. Purim is a holiday that celebrates the victory of Queen Esther against bad guy Ammon. He lived in ancient Persia. He was bent on genocide. He was a kind of an ancient Hitler. <laughs> but when the Persian Haman plotted his ancient holocaust, he decided to leave the date for the beginning of the slaughter up to a game of chance. In fact, the word Purim itself is the Persian word for throwing dice or casting lots. Now, most people, they want to figure out, is this myth or is it history? I want to go beyond that. I want to go and actually find the game he played. I want to find the archaeological proof of the dice that Haman threw. I'm going out there to find the poor in Purim. Because of the story of Purim first comes to us from the book of Esther in the Hebrew scriptures, I'm going back to the original text to look for solid clues. The story begins by telling us how the holy temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians back in the 6th century BCE, and the Jews were exiled to Babylonia, what is now modern Iraq. Later. When Babylon is taken over by the Persians, the Persian king Ahasuerus throws a party for himself, where he demands that his wife Vashti dance naked before him in front of all his guests, a demand that Vashti outright refuses. And so, to find out what naked dancing has to do with genocide, I'm meeting with biblical expert Rabbi Shmuel Spiro. He wants her to dance naked, isn't that true? That's what we're told. In the end, the response that is chosen is to exit her out of the picture. Kill her. Vashti gone was the headline. Right. Now, king's got a problem, no queen. So right. what happens next? Maybe the first recorded pageant. Wow, yeah. it's like the Miss Universe pageant. Yeah. With his queen now dead, King Ahasuerus orders his royal scouts to gather up the most beautiful women from all the towns in the Persian Empire which at that time included 127 countries from Egypt to India, with their headquarters in modern Iran. And one of these women was a good-looking Jewish girl who was known to us as Esther. Even though Esther is forced into a harem with the unsavory prospect of having to have sex with a pagan king, Esther's uncle Mordechai is a political leader in the Persian capital, and he convinces her that it would be in both of their best interests to win the beauty pageant outright. He also advises her to keep her Jewish identity a secret from the king. And then Esther's natural beauty wins the king's heart, and she beats out hundreds of other would-be brides to become the queen of all of Persia. But at the same time that Esther becomes queen, there's another figure rising up the ranks of Persian power. His name is Haman. Haman is the king's most trusted vizier, and he hates Esther's uncle Mordechai. More than that, he has a maniacal plan to kill all the Jews in Persia. Genocide, like a Hitler-type Holocaust plan, right? Yeah, he wants to really get rid of them. And, and he has a day for it. But he gets to that date through a game. Yeah. They drew lots or they threw dice, but they did something that they felt... Yeah, they felt it had some 
you know... Divine intervention. Right. Above force, fit. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great to, to figure out what game did he play to determine the date? I'd like to hear it. It might even give insights into the story of Purim and the Book of Esther itself. Finding out which game Haman played when deciding the fate of the Jews isn't the only mystery surrounding the story of Purim. Another mystery is the fact that the Book of Esther is the only book in the Holy Hebrew texts that doesn't mention God at all. And Esther's name is actually the Hebrew word for hidden. So if I'm going to find the Purim in Purim, my quest should begin with Queen Esther. I'm on a quest to decode the Purim story in the Book of Esther and find out which game Haman could have played when deciding the date of his planned Holocaust. So who better to start with than Queen Esther herself? If I can find evidence of her, then maybe I'll find clues for the game Haman played. One tradition says that Esther is buried alongside her uncle Mordechai in the Galilee of northern Israel, near the ancient city of Baram. So that's where I'm meeting with archaeologist Danny Herman. This is the, the synagogue of Baram. So this is 14, 1500 years old. Yeah, pretty impressive. Now, the earliest uh, reference to the grave of Esther is to this place. And people dig and they find this village. Limited excavations were done here. So maybe there's yet an Esther scroll over here somewhere. Yeah, it would be a nice discovery. But the suspected location of Esther's grave was discovered in the forest just outside Baram back in 1949. So that's where I'm headed now to see if I can find clues that will tell me which game Haman really played. I look at it and I see a big pile of rocks. Well, it's handmade rocks in some cases. Look at uh, this uh, stone slab. It's definitely man-made. It's hewn to this shape. Look at the size of these stones. It's not so easy to hew even today. Stones of this size, and you don't really put them in the middle of nowhere for no reason. OK, now, right over here, it says the place of burial of Mordechai and Esther. They are the heroes of the Purim story. Yes. You know, people don't just walk around and choose a rock and say, this must be the burial place of Esther. How did people get to this conclusion? In the 12th century, uh, some rabbi who comes here in the times of the Crusades, he mentions a, a mark of the tomb of Esther near the village of Baram. In some process, it's uh, sanctified and uh, venerated ever since. Here, right next to us, we have uh, people coming and praying at the site. <laughs> The ground beneath these stones has yet to be excavated, so there's no way to say if Esther or her uncle Mordechai are actually buried here. And because there's no mention of games anywhere around Esther's grave, I still can't say for sure which game Haman played. So to uncover more clues, I'm taking another look at the Book of Esther, where it clearly says that Haman cast lots. Back then, casting lots was an all-purpose term for playing any game of chance and appears 77 different times in the Bible itself. And probably the most famous instance of casting lots comes from the Gospel of Luke, where it says that at the time of the crucifixion, Roman soldiers cast lots to decide who gets Jesus' garments. Luckily, the Romans left a lot of evidence for which games they liked to play. And back in Jesus' time, one of the most popular games of chance was called Nine Men's Morris, which, as fate would have it, was found carved on Roman roads not far from Queen Esther's tomb in the ruins of ancient Susita. And here we are. This is... This is it? That's the best example of the Nine Men's Morris. The game involves two players with nine pieces each, which are introduced to the board one at a time. The goal of the game is to form rows of three, at which point you can remove one of your opponent's pieces. And the player who's left with less than three pieces is the loser. With these rules in mind, Danny and I start playing on a 2,000-year-old board game. We're actually playing. We're not kidding around. I'll block you over here. 
Could this really be the game that Luke was describing? So do you think they were playing this game? This was a popular game back then. It's very uh, possible. You're connecting it to the games that were played over Jesus' clothes. Yeah. And this is a Roman road and this is a Roman game. Yeah. And those were Roman soldiers that played the game. Yes. And they say they played it like literally on the street almost. This was not just for the fun of it. This was over money. I'm sure about this. But it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you win. <laughs> wow. I just played the same game that Roman soldiers played 2,000 years ago over Jesus' clothes. And on a purely karmic level, I'm glad I didn't win. But then, I don't believe that this version of Casting Lots is the same game that Haman played. First of all, Nine Men's Morris was played by first century Roman soldiers, not the Persian elite of some 600 years earlier. But also, it doesn't involve dice, whereas the game Haman played must have used some sort of dice, since Purim is the Persian word for dice. If I can find a game of chance that better matches this criteria, then I can decode how Haman tried to plan his holocaust against the Jews. Hey, a tractor isn't exactly a subtle archaeological tool, but I'm trying to uncover which game Haman would have played when trying to decide the fate of the Jews. And to discover that, I'm going to have to learn some of the ancient world's most famous games of chance. In the Book of Esther, it says Haman cast lots. But then I also know Purim is the Persian word for dice. So whatever game Haman really played, it would have had to involve throwing some kind of dice. And one of the ancient world's most popular forms of dice were called astragali which were made out of the knuckle bones of sheep. To find out how knuckle bones work as dice, I'm enlisting the help of an expert in ancient games, Dr. Irving Finkel. So in front of us, we've got knuckle bones, or what the Romans called it, astragali. So knuckle bones have been used as dice. For thousands of years. For a very long period of time. If you take one of these bones and look at it, you've got two flat sides and two narrow sides. When you're familiar with these bones, you can tell it instantly which of the faces uppermost. So it generates numbers one to four. What's the significance of these guys? Well, these are rather interesting because they're not real bone. They're artificially made. They're fake bone? They're fake. This one is uh, iron. It's kind of stylized. In comparison with the real bone, it's lost a lot of the subtlety. Because if you look at a knuckle bone, you can see there are all these caves and scoops and each face has a specific shape, which they knew by heart. But when they made one out of metal, the edge is just flat, you see here? It doesn't have any of the scoops. So if you throw this, you wouldn't be sure whether it was meant to be one or the other. And the person who owned this or made this has put the number three on here. Oh, three my God. Holes. It's the origin of the dice. This is fantastic. This is, this is when I get excited about these things. Here you have the original. Look at all the subtlety that it has because it's a real bone. And now they're into manufacturing it. So you actually see the evolution of the dice because here you have character and here you have... Modern rubbish. Mod <laughs> it's not quite modern rubbish, but it's getting to be modern. Here everybody can tell which side is which, but here they can't, so they have to put three little dots. And now we have the birth of the modern dice. Wow, I've just traced the evolution of these knuckle bones into four-sided dice. The modern six-sided dice evolved separately, however, more than 3,000 years ago. Either way, both knuckle bones and dice were far too common to be used by the elite and too simple for Haman to have used them to decide the perfect day for his genocide. Another clue for which game Haman would have played comes from the Talmud, the Jewish book of rabbinical law, where it says that Haman started out as an astrologer before becoming chief advisor to the Persian king. So if I'm going to find out which game Haman played, it'll need to have an astrological code built right into its design. Total 
I'm on a quest to uncover which game of chance Haman would have played to determine the best date for his planned holocaust. I've managed to come up with a short list of clues. The game would have been popular with Persian royalty back in the 6th century BCE. It also would have involved dice, and it would have had an astrological code that could be used to predict the future. And it just so happens that I've managed to uncover one game that matches all these traits. This is a replica of a 4,500-year-old board game called the Royal Game of War. It was first discovered in the 1920s in the Royal Tombs of War by archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley in what's now Iraq. And it's one of the oldest board games ever. It's also the best bet yet for the game Haman could have played. But to make sure I'm right, I'm headed to the British Museum in London where they have one of the original game boards, including cuneiform tablets that record the rules of the game, and where my friend Irving Finkel just happens to be the curator. When Sir Leonard Woolley found these things, he also found the pieces, and there were seven for each of the two players. Can I get seven? You can have seven. And uh, there were these funny dice, these tetrahedral dice. They have four sides, and when you throw them, some upturned corners have a white mark, and these are the ones that you count. Unlike other ancient board games, these pyramidal-shaped dice were unique to the Royal Game of War. But over time, the general public replaced these with knuckle balls, and the pyramidal dice became rare, perhaps used only by the elite and by astrologers. And it was a race game. So, Simcha, you will come in here, okay. and your route is as follows. You come along here, turn the corner, up the middle, round this corner, and off. We stick to our own side. And in this avenue, we're at war. So if I'm sitting here and you get enough score to come along like this and land on this square, you knock me off, I have to start again. Great. Okay? I did nothing. Ah, you see? You've got to try harder. Just watch this. Sunshine. You will never get. What do we have oh, there? Oh, no, you got two, so you didn't land on me. How? Just oh. Just don't it. <sighs> Experience shows at a time like this, you know. Playing the game for myself, I can see how it would have been entertaining for the ancients. But when Haman played, he wouldn't have been competing against Irving Finkel. Instead, he would have pitted his own belief in random chance against both God and the Jewish people. But to come up with an exact date for his genocide, he would have attempted to tap into the game's astrological code which he could have done by playing on an alternate version of the game's basic design. This alternate royal game had 12 squares in the middle row, and these represented the months of the year. Depending on which month you landed on, this could bring either good or bad fortune. Using this code, Haman could have come up with the month of Adar, Adar being the 12th and final month of the year in both the Babylonian and Hebrew calendars. But choosing a specific date was a bit more complicated. You see, the seven pieces that Haman played with actually represented the seven classical planets, one of which was Mars, which the Persians identified with Nargal, the Babylonian god of war and death. And since the night of the 13th and 14th day of each month, were considered Nargal's holy days, then by landing with the Nargal piece on the Nargal square, Haman could have easily come up with the 13th day of Adar as the perfect time to kill the Jews, especially since cults devoted to Nargal's wicked ways had become popular in the Persia of the 6th century BCE when the story of Purim takes place. Far-fetched? Well, the British Museum also has a gate from ancient Babylon that not only depicts Narga, but also has the royal game of Ur scratched into its base. I'm now convinced that I found the game Haman played in the Book of Esther, but thankfully Haman's schemes never worked out. 
And before Haman could turn this game into genocide, Queen Esther caught wind of his plans. So she set up a trap that lured Haman to her bedroom. And when King Ahasuerus discovered Haman seemingly trying to force himself on his new bride, Haman and his sons were put to death by a public hanging. And the Jewish people were saved. Which is why Purim is still celebrated every Adar, every year by Jews around the world. And this year, in my house, I've invited Irving Finkel to celebrate Purim with my family by making the traditional cookies called Haman's Ears. It is look yummy, like yummy, sure yummy. And playing several rounds of the royal game of war. Why are we making these cookies? It looks like it's because it's the same shape. This is like the triangle. You're right. Look at that. They look just like the dice of the royal game of Ur. Nice. Hey, do I have a family here? You know what? I think we found it. We went out looking for a 2,500-year-old game of dice, and we found it. We found a game that was used by the elite, that was played for thousands of years, that had encoded astrological symbols. We're talking about the royal game of Ur. It must have been the game that Haman played when he attempted to decide the fate of the Jewish people by the throw of a dice. But what's hidden in the Purim story is that while Haman seemingly chose the month of Adar by chance, he inadvertently picked Adar, the month of the birth and death of Moses, the most important prophet in the Jewish faith. In doing so, he fulfilled the biblical proverb, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Or as Einstein once theorized, God doesn't play dice. He's a total man from a total